Karen Dynan is a professor of the practice in the, Har in the Harvard University Department of Economics and at the Harvard Kennedy School. She previously served as Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and Chief Economist at the U.S. Treasur Department of the Treasury from 2014 to 2017. From 2009 to 2013, Dynan was Vice President and Co-Director of the Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institution. Before that, she was on the staff of the Federal Reserve Board, leading work in macroeconomics forecasting, household finances, and the Fed's response to the financial crisis. Dynan has also served as a Senior Economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors, and as a visiting assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. Her current research focuses on fiscal and other types of macroeconomic policy, consumer behavior, and household finances. She is also currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Professor Dynan received her PhD in economics from Harvard University and her AB from Brown University. Thank you so much for joining us on this important topic today. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Erica, for that introduction. I'm going to start by sharing some slides. Um, yeah, so I am going to talk about um, the COVID-19 recession and uh, recovery uh, with a focus on um, kind of policy issues. Uh, this is obviously a, a vast topic, and I have a limited period of time to cover it. Um, but I will do my best to, to hit on issues that I think are most important and will be a broad interest, but we've got Q&A after I'm done with my slides, and I'd be happy to take your questions on whatever you're interested in. Um, so anyway, the starting point is that the COVID-19 pandemic led to the second devastating economic crisis of the 21st century. Um, I think we all know this, uh, but to give you a, a sense of the kind of size of the global crisis, um, the International Labor Organization estimates that working hours fell by the equivalent of 255 million full-time jobs. It's a huge number in 2020. Uh, four times greater than during the financial crisis of 2009. Um, so I'm going to focus on this economic crisis and the policy response. I'll cover um, key features of the, of the recession we've seen. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to then, before I get to economic policy, um, talk about some of the important um, changes in thinking in the years leading up to the pandemic that have um, shaped the way we're approaching economic policy. Um, and in addition to talking to what's talking about what economic policy steps we've taken, I'm going to then talk about um, what lies ahead. So starting with key features of the COVID-19 recession, um, I want to start by saying uh, there have been uh, similarities in terms of the economic fallout across countries. Um, this is kind of a pattern that many, many countries uh, saw. Uh, they saw a deep plunge in economic activity as they shut down in the spring of 2020 to um, contain that first wave of the virus. And then we saw this period um, over the next couple of months where there was a, a sharp partial economic recovery because countries found that there, were, there was a kind of sector of the economy, a set of businesses that could safely reopen after um, they'd figured out what public health measures were necessary to keep uh, employees and customers safe. Um, so we saw this kind of initial V, but then things really flattened out and we saw a subnormal pace of economic activity thereafter uh, with the weakness really concentrated unsurprisingly in high contact services industry. Um, I put up here in terms of visuals, um, if you're an economist and you'd like to nerd out and talk about recessions uh, being shaped like a V or a U or a W, the shape that, um, economists have kind of settled on for this recession is the reverse radical sign, if you think about a square root sign and kind of flip it over. Um, but just to kind of persuade you that this is not all uh, just kind of hypothetical thinking, I'm actually showing you uh, US employment uh, in the lower right panel and uh, showing you that it does look just like a reverse radical sign. Uh, and this is what many countries have seen. And one really important thing I want you to note about this chart is that it goes through current times. And I want you to note that activity flattened out at a level that was um, really uh, kind of only about halfway back to what was normal, which means that we have kind of an enormous way to go to get to a recovery. 
Um, and then the kind of last piece of the common pattern is robust recovery only after a large share of the population is vaccinated. Um, some countries are doing better than others without those vaccinations, uh, but I think the, the, the view has become that really uh, you need those vaccinations before a recovery can be robust and sustained. So that's the similarities. Um, let me talk now about important, important differences across countries. Um, so very different economic prospects. Uh, to give you a sense of them, what I'm showing you here is basically um, revisions that the IMF did to their forecasts uh, once the pandemic set in, and they've done them for different groupings of countries. So you can see, uh, for example, in blue, you can see the richer economies, the advanced economies, according to the IMF. Um, and you see this kind of plunge in, uh, you know, their forecast in 2020, not surprising, that's when activities, activity really collapsed. Um, but you can see um, large, large declines for all sorts of countries. You can see for emerging markets outside of uh, China and even larger decline in 2020. But the thing I want you to really notice about this chart is what's going on in 2021 and 2022. What you're seeing is for the advanced economies, you're seeing this gap close between where the IMF thinks GDP is going to be and where it would have been in the absence of the pandemic. Okay, much slower recoveries um, for the lower income countries, uh, the emerging market uh, countries and the low income and developing countries, their gaps are not closing like they are for the advanced economies. So that's a very important difference. Um, now, why are we seeing these different economic patterns? There's a whole host of reasons, but let me put on some of the kind of top uh, reasons that I've been looking at. So of course, number one, virus prevalence and vaccine rates. We know that some countries are uh, fortunate enough to be uh, far uh, ahead of other countries in this regard. Um, you know, the estimates vary depending on where you're looking. The recent estimates I've seen suggest that only about half of the world's population will be vaccinated by the end of 2021. So that's a big deal, both in terms of what has happened and what is going to happen. Two, idiosyncratic factors. Uh, so some countries just started uh, kind of in a weaker state than other countries, but there's kind of a composition of economic activity within a country that determines how exposed they are to the virus. So if you have a, a bigger, small and medium enterprise sector, uh, those, those businesses, the smaller businesses got hit harder. So you're more exposed if you were more dependent on tourism or if you were more dependent on commodities. Uh, where we saw a big slump in the market last year, you were hit harder. Um, the last and um, kind of uh, factor that I'll, that I'll really be emphasizing in this talk is countries' fiscal response, okay? Supporting the economy through their tax and spending measures. Um, and there's just been this huge range across countries um, varying from something like 20% um, or more of GDP in the United States to very little in the lowest income countries. Um, this is just a graphic from the IMF showing the kind of uh, different fiscal responses um, across countries around the world. The green countries are the ones that have spent the most. Um, the red countries are the countries that have spent the least. And not surprisingly, again, this is what I said in the last slide, you're seeing kind of much less uh, spending in the lower income countries. And I wanna emphasize that that's partly because of different needs but importantly, because of different abilities to finance spending, different abilities in particular to borrow, to finance government spending. I'll come back on that. Um, I get asked about, well, what about these, you know, formal restrictions on activities? You know, it, doesn't that really um, kind of drive, uh, you know, a country's, um, uh, you know, how they've fared in the pandemic? Um, the answer is um, we actually, um, it's, it's hard to tell because uh, formal uh, restrictions tend to be put down where the virus is worse, but there's been kind of an interesting economic literature that looks across regions um, and in particular focuses on regions that are 
similar to each other, but have very different restrictions. And what that literature has concluded is that the formal restriction by itself doesn't seem to make a big difference, but perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, you know, it's, it's really the fear of the virus that's keeping people home and out of the economy rather than whether there's a formal restriction. The graph I'm showing you here is just a graph that was done uh, in the United States studying uh, kind of two states, just the, the communities right around the border and showing that uh, you know, they had very different restrictions, but showing the fall in economic activity was similar. People have done these sorts of um, studies across countries. There was an early study, for example, of Norway and Sweden showing the same thing. Um, in addition to um, the fallout varying across countries, another important thing uh, that, that, that people need to understand is that um, it's varied within countries uh, depending on the population. And really kind of the most striking factor has been the different impact on workers who are um, kind of high wage, high skill versus in the knowledge economy, able to work remotely versus workers who have lower skills and are not able to work remotely. Um, so this is just a graph. Um, again, this is IMF uh, analysis, um, but basically showing you that low skill workers in advanced economies um, uh, on the left in, in lower income economies on the right, they saw a larger rise in the unemployment rate and of course, um, in addition to looking at unemployment, you wanna look at labor force participation because sometimes the labor market situation is so bad, people aren't even looking for jobs. So they're not even counted as unemployed. They just kind of dropped out altogether. But again, if you look at labor force participation, you see the same pattern, uh, you know, low skill workers, low wage workers hit um, kind of measurably bad, worse than uh, kind of higher skill, higher wage workers. Um, so uh, kind of mix this all together between the fiscal constraints on poorer countries and the greater impact on kind of low wage, low skill workers. Um, this has meant a very big setback in progress towards uh, reducing extreme poverty. So um, this is analysis um, uh, done by the World Bank, but um, you know the, the pattern you're seeing here, this is kind of changes in the number of extreme poor around the world over time. Um, the horizontal axis is a little uh, hard to see, but um, what you're seeing is over the, the 2000s, the first decade, the second decade, you're seeing a reduction in extreme poverty every single year until you get to 2020. And you see this, that blue bar sticking up in 2020 at the right side of the graph, you see this big reversal in the number of extreme poor. So um, that's your, uh, you know, th this is kind of the basic features of the recession. Uh, some common pattern, big disparities driven by different things across countries. And then even within countries, um, the differences in the experience of different types of workers. Okay, so with that background, um, what I want to do now before I get to um, actual uh, economic policy steps taken, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of shifts in economic thinking uh, in the years leading up to the crisis. Sometimes when I teach, I call this the, the between times because they were between this horrible economic crisis we had um, about 12 years ago, the global financial crisis and um, kind of the, the current economic crisis. Uh, but, you know, if people um, kind of want to know why the policy response has been different in this period, one answer is just very different crisis. But another is some important think ch changes in thinking in terms of the way we think about policy. Um, so macroeconomic thinking uh, started to shift in the le years leading up to the pandemic. Um, kind of there were new facts or ones brought, in, brought into sharper focus because of new research or just the experience of the crisis we'd just been through, you know, thinking about the underlying economics, a reevaluation of concerns and risk. And I'm going to walk you through um, what I see are four of the most important kind of insights over this period. Um, I want to 
I want to throw out the caveat before I do that, that this is not, um, there are different degrees of consensus around these insights. So they go from being ideas that are being kind of talked about by some prominent macroeconomists to facts that are fairly widely accepted. So I want to make sure you understand that these are um, kind of really kind of the start, the start of kind of shifts in thinking. So insight number one, uh, and this one turns out to be really important. Um, real interest rates had fallen markedly during the early, uh, or sorry, since the early 1990s. Um, and this is a graph showing an estimate of um, real interest rates on government bonds in advanced economies. Why that group? Because I'm trying to identify kind of real interest rates on safe assets. That'll become important later in my talk. Um, but you can see this striking decline uh, since, uh, you know, this graph starts in 1980, but, you know, it's really um, a number of percentage points, depending on the measure you're looking at, it's as high as five percentage points. Um, why am I calling this an insight? Isn't this just obvious? Didn't everyone just know this? Um, well, the answer is um, not really. So economists, uh, even though now you can see very clearly this was a trend that had been underway for years, economists didn't really pay attention to it much until um, interest rates failed to rise when the economy strengthened after the Great Recession. Um, just even based on my own experience in the policy world, if you went back to kind of the period before the financial crisis and you looked at, you know, interest rates were lower then they'd been, than they'd been in the 1990s. But if you looked at forecasts, people's forecasts were like, oh, they're just going to revert back to where they had been. So it was really only in the last decade we realized, oh, this is something that actually looks like it's permanent. And there's been this research now that kind of looks at the, the economics underpinnings. I'm not going to go through it now for the sake of time, but I put in a hyperlink if you want to uh, read about it. But it's but this has been produced by some longer term trends um, that don't look likely to reverse anytime soon. Um, implications of lower interest rates, uh, in particular, the policy implications. Um, one, which um, people are probably familiar about with, is that um, monetary policy, which had been many governments' main tools for fighting recessions, it was, it was no longer as useful because the jumping off point when economy uh, went into a recession just had gotten lower and lower and lower as interest rates had trended down. So there was less kind of space to lower interest rates with the recession. This is what's sometimes called the zero lower bound problem. So what does that mean in terms of policy to fight recessions? Well, it means Fiscal policy has to play a bigger role, but on top of that, it also means fiscal policy, government, uh, you know, tax changes and spending, less costly as a tool for fighting recessions because that lower interest rate means um, kind of, you know, to start, it means lower payment on that debt. I've given you a screenshot here from Olivier Blanchard, who uh, was at the time president of the American Economic Association, and he gave this very kind of striking uh, talk in January 2019, where he said, you know what, given these lower interest rates, all this kind of worry we've been doing about government debt over the years, it doesn't seem as right because these lower interest rates change the picture. So this foreshadows some of the policy decisions that were made during the pandemic recession. Um, insight number two, this was coming out of the Great Recession. It can take a long time for economies to recover from a bad recession. I'm showing you my favorite uh, recession indicator here, the unemployment rate. I'm showing it for three economies that were really hit by the Great Recession. Um, and the vertical line uh, really kind of marks the financial crisis, the start of that economic weakness. Um, but what I want you to see in this chart is just how long it took for these economies, the US, the UK, the Euro, economy, Euro area, um, to get back to their pre-crisis uh, unemployment rates. So it was about a decade for the US and the UK. And for the Euro area, it was a dozen years. That's a long time. Um, you know, when you add up the number of people who are unemployed and facing hardship, uh, it's a long time for a recovery. Um, insight number three, um, this has to do with once economies have recovered, 
Uh, there's this term high pressure, meaning kind of robust economies, economies that are, are really kind of, uh, kind of uh, fully deployed. Um, they have um, important distributional benefits. And I'm telling you this because um, you know, there's been this rise in income inequality uh, you know, within countries, uh, many of the richer countries around the world. Um, and this has caused all this concern about distributional issues. Um, these issues have long been viewed as microeconomist territory. So what do you do about income inequality? You do things like you provide more education or you provide better housing, better access to healthcare. Um, that's what you do about e inequality. And it was really this kind of um, what we saw happening in, in the highest pressure economies around the world in the late 2010s that made people realize, hey, wait a second, it's also macro territory. Um, this is just uh, evidence from the U.S. Um, showing you um, kind of uh, median net worth for U.S. families, but in particular, I'm showing you groups that traditionally have low wealth in shaky finances. And um, I'm showing you the bottom, the income distribution, Black families, Hispanic families, and it's showing you what happened um, basically for each set of bars. I'm starting in 2007 and showing you changes of wealth over the subsequent three years. Um, but what you can see is big hit to wealth during the Great Recession period and during this very weak recovery we had. But then suddenly, when the economy heats up, the macro conditions heat up in the late 2010s, you see kind of suddenly a big improvement and a welcome kind of development uh, in terms of family finances. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons, um, you know, behind, uh, you know, the, the, the really robust policy response that we've seen, at least in countries that have been able to afford it. Um, insight number four, okay, what else do we think about when we think of high pressure economies? We think about the fact that there might be risking inflation. Uh, so this is something that we saw in the 60s and the 70s in some of these economies that yes, you can kind of run the economy strong, uh, create a lot of jobs, improve people's financial standing in the kind of near term, uh, but there's going to be a cost for that. There's going to be inflation. Um, well, OK, what we learned in the latter 2010s is that's not necessarily going to be the case. And again, I'm, I'm showing you a, um, a, a chart here. Um, I've picked kind of countries, uh, particularly the US and the UK, where really things got kind of hot in the latter part of the 2010s. And then what I'm showing you is their inflation rates. Uh, you know, if you focus on the medium blue line and the gray line. Um, and what you see here is despite these high pressure economies that they were running, no inflation. I mean, inflation's not picking up. It's not kind of. It's not even getting up as high as the two percent target of central banks. Okay, um, and you know, what do you take away from that? Well, what you take away from that is that you know the high pressure economy um, might be a, a kind of necessary condition to get this kind of inflation overheating, but it's not sufficient, okay? What you also need, and this is what economists have um, come, this is a view they've come to after a lot of research on it, you also need inflation expectations picking up. So what happened in these economies in the late 2010s was that inflation expectations just went nowhere. So even though kind of the economy was, um, these economies were hot, you weren't seeing the people who set prices uh, react to that uh, by raising their prices a bunch because they just didn't expect general prices levels, general prices in the economy to rise a lot. Okay, so that's your um, kind of lesson about macroeconomics that will inform your thinking about uh, both the policy response that has occurred and um, kind of what, what may happen going forward and what the right policy response would be. Um, so let me talk now about um, the economic policy uh, steps uh, taken. So I already told you monetary policy limited by low rates, zero lower bound problem. OK, but that doesn't mean that central banks were unimportant. They played an important role. So I ask you, do you remember the financial crisis of 2020? OK. Um, so <laughs> a lot of you are probably thinking, hmm, uh, not really. Uh, there was a lot going on in March 2020. Uh, I don't remember financial crisis, but uh, in fact, uh, we saw severe financial market dysfunction around the world in March 2020. Um, not hard to understand what was going on. 
businesses were seeing, uh, because of the pandemic, a period of uh, greatly reduced revenues. Um, but they knew had, they had ongoing expenses. They had you know, debt to service. They had rent to pay. Uh, and so on. Uh, and so what everybody was trying to do was they were trying to convert everything into cash. So they had cash on hand to handle those expenses. So we had what was called a dash for cash. But what was so unusual was people were just dumping even kind of super safe U.S. Treasury bonds on the market, trying to sell them getting cash in return, which is not what you usually see in a crisis. Usually in the crisis, you see people go for stuff like cash, but you also say, you see people saying, oh, well, I'll also hold kind of these safe kind of government bonds as well. Um, but this all led to um, lots of kind of volatility and dysfunction in financial markets. Um, so, you know, the, the short answer is that people don't remember the financial crisis of 2020 because central banks stepped in swiftly to provide uh, what amounted to trillions of dollars of liquidity to markets. Um, so they did this for kind of their own markets, but um, there was also, um, in terms of high demand currencies like the US dollars, there was a lot of um, kind of money being sent around the world. I'm showing you a picture of kind of central bank, a graphic that's capturing central bank uh, cash uh, swap lines where the New York Fed is sending uh, dollars to all these central banks around the world. Okay, they did that. They established various lending programs to make sure that credit continued to flow to key sectors of the economy, kind of all building off the lessons of the financial crisis period. Um, but I wanted to call it out before I went to fiscal policy, because really in the absence of these steps, we might have seen a much more severe financial crisis that greatly amplified the economic crisis from the pandemic. So when you think about policy during this period, I know everybody wants to talk about the fiscal policy. The monetary policy has not been in the front of our brains because it worked, or the central bank policy, because it worked so effectively. And that's a lesson you should keep in mind. Okay, so let me go down to fiscal policy. Okay. Um, first thing, much more aggressive than after the financial crisis, um, took different forms as well. Um, so, uh, you know, just in terms of grouping, we saw, of course, uh, measures to fight the virus and support the healthcare system, whether it was money for PPE, testing, vaccine procurement, hospitals, and so on. We saw um, measures to protect households. Basically, you know, we knew there was going to be all this job loss, all this earnings reduction. Uh, but we saw countries sending out, uh, in the United States, for example, we sent out what was called COVID checks, meaning just direct payments to households. We saw countries making payments to their businesses to basically cover payroll expenses um, on the condition they retain their employees. We saw household tax credits in some countries, expanded unemployment benefits, enhancements to other safety net programs, um, in-kind support. Um, all of these things were done to protect households. And then the last thing we saw is we saw measures to keep businesses from failing. Okay, we saw tax breaks for businesses, grants for businesses, loan guarantees, subsidized loans, um, in some countries, a real focus on the small business sector, because small businesses in particular are so financially fragile uh, and don't have access to broader capital markets to get the money. So um, that's the kind of general um, uh, kind of things that were done. Um, I want to talk about kind of why we did the things we did. Uh, by asking what the goals of fiscal policy should be in a pandemic. Um, again, some of the economics behind what happened, um, they inform both what has happened in the past, they inform uh, what we still need to be thinking about given that employment is only uh, in some countries uh, halfway back to where it was prior to the pandemic. Um, so first goal, of course, already went through this one, fight the virus, that is an obvious goal. Um, second goal, relieve hardship. And that should be a pretty obvious um, goal as well. We saw, uh, you know, around the world, um, hundreds of millions of jobs um, lost. Uh, if you're going to have all that reduction in earnings, uh, you need huge cuts. And uh, I mean, if you want to avoid, oh, sorry, if you're going to have those big reductions in earning and you want to avoid huge cuts in consumption, uh, you have to come in with fiscal policy and replace those earnings. Um, 
so how, did fiscal policy do this? I've already told you in some countries, um, they were not able to do as much of it. Uh, in other countries, including in the United States, yeah, there have been arguments about, well, how targeted has it actually been? Have they done it right? Did we do enough? Um, I think the answer here is that, um, I mean, we know for sure hardship occurred. Um, and I think it's actually gonna be years before we understand the full extent of it in countries around the world. Uh, you know, if this is, you know, something that you, uh, if you're interested in data or research, I just really think it's kind of a gap. We understand well who's losing their job, but we don't actually understand directly kind of what is happening to their well-being in a lot of cases. Um, I will say, you know, based on the kind of bits and pieces of evidence I've seen out there, um, countries that were able to deploy aggressive fiscal policy, it looks to have been a success blunting the effects of the massive job loss. This is um, data that just came out this week from the Federal Reserve, uh, speaks to the United States. Um, but basically, I actually think it's quite striking. Um, this, they asked households, you know, they have a measure of whether households reported in a survey doing at least okay financially. Um, and it's, this is showing you the plot over time. And um, I guess two things that you should see for all of the lines, um, you know, as you go from 2019 to 2020, you don't see a plunge in households saying they're doing okay, as you might expect given the massive job loss, okay? Um, but you do see for, um, you know, disparities across groups, um, you do see disparities. I mean, first of all, if you're asking white households whether they're doing okay, far more likely to say they're doing okay in a general sense than black and Hispanic households, you can also see that Basically, the number saying they were doing okay actually increased in 2020, whereas it fell some for other uh, for Black and Hispanic households. Okay, so um, we think that fiscal policy, when it could be used, it did relieve hardship. Um, third goal: um, avoid scarring. This is a big one. Okay, minimize damage to economic structures that could weigh on the recovery or cause a permanently lower level of output over the longer run. OK, so you know, the whole idea, you may have heard this metaphor early on in the, when the pandemic first uh, set in, uh, you know, people would say, well, we want to close things down, close things down, like putting a patient to sleep if they've suffered an injury and putting them into an induced coma. So that then when their injury heals, um, you know, we can wake them up and they can just go back to normal. OK, this is what we were trying to do with economies, which is we wanted to prevent kind of anything bad happening while it was shut down that then would make it hard to recover once the pandemic was behind us. So, in fact, um, there's a super interesting kind of literature that thinks about this scarring. and there are all these potential channels of scarring. Um, after the Great Recession, for example, we saw, you know, lengthy periods of unemployment and we saw households basically we saw an erosion of their skills. Skills, uh, or they're just like their uh, kind of their habits in terms of like waking up and getting ready to go to work and getting to work um, that um, basically impeded labor market recovery. Uh, so that's like a form of scarring we saw after the Great Recession. But you can imagine with all of this job loss, you could see households taking on tons of debt to um, replace the lost earnings. And then once the pandemic is behind you, they've got all this debt to service and they can't go back to a normal state of spending. Um, businesses, you can imagine, uh, you know, if you get business failures, um, you know, normally we think that when a business fails, you know, the restaurant down the street goes uh, belly up. We think, well, that's going to be replaced with another restaurant. Uh, but you think of everything that's lost when that first restaurant goes because they had these relationships with customers, these relationships with suppliers. They had their menu crafted. Uh, they, they had a kind of a business model. They had this know-how that gets lost when that business fails. It makes it harder to recover from a setback. Um, so you want to use economic policy to avoid that. Okay, um, so just to kind of sum up where we are at so far, uh, you know, it's just pretty clear these first three goals are ones you want to meet. Now, for those of you who've had economics before, you're probably saying, well, what about this the traditional argument for fiscal stimulus when you have a recession, incomes decline, and you have kind of 
you know, people selling things, there's just merchandise on the shelves and nobody there to buy it. And so what you do with uh, fiscal policies, you give money for people to, to go out and buy that stuff so that they're these businesses don't have to fire their employees and you kind of curb the recession that way. Um, well, that's kind of an interesting um, thing to think about in this situation, because this is not a typical recession like that. Um, we actually think supply is constrained. There are businesses that just haven't been able to open up um, because of the pandemic, because they can't do so safely for their employees and their customers. So it's not like we've got kind of stock sitting on shelves that's not being purchased. Um, so do you want that fiscal stimulus uh, in this case? And that's going to be very relevant to something I'll be talking about in a minute. Okay, so um, now let's turn to uh, kind of the last part, last stuff I want to talk about, which is, okay, so what's next? Um, so uh, basic story, uh, the recovery appears to be shifting into high gear for countries where the population is being rapidly vaccinated. Uh, with much of the rest of the world expected to follow. So this is one of my favorites in the upper left, you can see one of my favorite series for the United States in terms of timely indicators, uh, because it's showing you job postings relative to January 2020, going all the way through May 7th, so very timely data. And you can see that basically starting a couple of months ago, uh, job postings just started to shoot up in the United States. And we have seen this happen in other economies that um, have been uh, where the vaccinations are occurring rapidly. So it's happening in the UK as well, for example. Um, but just a sign that the economy is going to be kind of growing briskly in coming months. On the lower right, I just put the um, kind of summary of the IMF projections showing that um, basically the expectation is that, uh, you know, uh, some countries will be uh, kind of surging ahead first, but that they'll be followed by other countries eventually. Okay, so that's a basic story. I would call this kind of like the baseline outlook. Okay, so then you always want to ask, well, what could go wrong? Um, there are challenges and risks ahead. Okay, I'm going to highlight like, three of the ones that I've been thinking most about. And I've been talking to my colleagues at the Kennedy School about. Um, first, I want to talk about an ongoing uh, K-shaped recovery. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But this is for people again nerding out with uh, kind of uh, you know shapes of recoveries. Um, then I want to talk about the possibility of a rise in inflation to undesirable levels in some of these countries that are um, uh, heating up uh, really briskly in coming months. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about uh, is government debt sustainability issues. Um, when I went, when I was talking about this aggressive fiscal policy, um, I, I, I kind of brushed that issue aside uh, about, you know, just how much some countries have spent and, you know, what it means that other countries haven't spent as much. Uh, and how we should think about all of that. Um, okay, so potential for K-shaped recovery, an ongoing K-shaped recovery. This is the K-shaped recovery meme, which is just, um, I alluded to this before, that basically if you're a professional, you're in the knowledge economy, you can work remotely. This has been actually a great period for your finances. You kept your job, you got a stimulus check from the government, and on top of that, um, because your consumption was pandemic constrained, you saved a bunch of money. Maybe you put it in the stock market, stock market's done really well, okay? You're doing fine, okay? But what about everybody else? What about those people? As I said before, the job loss has been concentrated in the lower part of the uh, kind of income skills distribution uh, because they don't have the option of working remotely, okay? so. The, the answer here, so, so we know this has happened already, you know, but, but what about going forward, okay? Prospects are looking brighter for lower income workers. For example, you could go and you could look at that job posting series that I just showed you and look at it, postings just for workers that had uh, minimal education. So if in the United States, there's a website called tracktherecovery.org set up by some of my colleagues here at, at Harvard. Uh, and you can do just this. You can go look at job postings for, uh, uh, you know, that require only minimal skills. And you can see the biggest rise in job postings has been uh, for that group. So that's good. 
for that group going forward. Um, but you need to consider the fact of just how many of these workers um, are out of jobs right now. And, uh, you know, to, to have a recovery, we're going to need to get them all back into jobs. Okay, so we're talking about uh, tens of millions of workers uh, globally that are need to get back into jobs. Um, and, you know, the economy will pick up, some of them will go right into jobs, um, but I think we need to worry some about um, you know, the fact that surviving businesses are going to emerge leaner, okay, maybe able to make, uh, because the, you know, by nature, the ones that survive are the ones that are most efficient, they're going to be able to produce more output with fewer workers. Um, and there's also survey data, I've got a hyperlink here, showing that a lot of businesses automated during the pandemic probably for various reasons, including the fact that the cost of human workers now looks uh, kind of larger now that uh, you can, uh, you know, you have to, you know, we can see they're exposed to health risks and they expose your customers to health risks. Um, so given that, I think we really have to be worried that kind of um, the jobs aren't going to all be there for those workers. Um, and what this means is that countries may see higher income inequality in the post-pandemic world. Um, so what do we do um, to try, I'll say, to try to avoid an ongoing shape, K-shaped recovery? Um, so first policy priority should be kind of worker reallocation measures. Sometimes we call these active labor market policies, um, but a real focus on uh, kind of assistance with job search, job placement centers, um, kind of training if if a worker, you know, if the job they had has gone away altogether, you know, just like step in, facilitate the matching of workers with jobs. Um, and I should say for some countries, it's going to be a, more of a challenge than others because some have actually been focused on basically retaining workers in the same jobs. You know, these are the ones that have been paying businesses to retain their workers. They really need to pivot to this kind of reallocation to get back to healthy economies. But then of course, um, there's just like a long list of things we needed to do to reduce inequality prior to the pandemic. You know, this out possible outcome from the pandemic just strengthens the need to do those things. We need to strengthen social safety nets uh, in countries where they're weak. Uh, we need to make more investments in poor children and their families. Okay, so that's the K-shaped recovery. Um, inflation possibility of a rise in inflation to undesirable levels. Uh, I was trying to figure out what graphic I would use here. I decided to go to Google Trends and just show you what you get if you type in inflation in Google Trends. This is globally, okay? Everybody's talking about inflation these days, okay? Um, partly because we're seeing some of it. Okay, but how should we think about that? Um, go back to what I talked about earlier in the talk, um, the determinants of inflation. We think they're um, basically slack, how hot the economy is, um, but also inflation expectations, okay? Slack, not hard to understand why people think slack is diminishing rapidly. Countries are really heating up. There's just this huge pent up demand. Most people have money to finance the spend, you know, this pent up demand, um, and there are just limits to how quickly economies can open up, okay? so. That part of the kind of recipe is there. And this is in fact why we're seeing some of these uh, price pressures. Um, but really to have kind of sustained inflation over the longer run, what you need also is a rise in inflation expectations. And I can tell you for the country that has um, kind of where there's the most worry about inflation in the United States, that inflation expectations, they've risen in recent weeks. You can see this in the graph I'm showing you at the right here, um, but the level is not particularly high. Uh, relative, this is just the data for the last decade. It's not particularly high for the level, uh, you know, for what we've seen over the past decade. So that should give us some reassurance. Um, I think under these circumstances, assuming inflation expectations remain contained, the odds of a 1970s style upward spiral inflation seem very low. Okay, but here's the real risk. The real risk is that central banks are gonna to have to tighten sooner than expected. If inflation rises, and I'll say significantly above their targets, the US Fed has said, look, you know, we're gonna let it go. We would like it to go a bit above the target for a while. But I mean, like, what if you're talking about a percentage point over the target um, on a sustained basis? Um, well, here the hope would be 
Central banks tighten, you get a soft landing. Markets aren't surprised because they've communicated well, economic growth kind of subsides, and inflation retreats. Um, I think the real risk here, though, is a hard landing, uh, meaning that the tightening kind of surprises, it shakes up financial markets. Um, you get maybe kind of a repricing of assets. You get the stock market crashing a bit. Um, you get maybe capital outflows uh, from lower income countries because rates are higher here. This could all be very disruptive in uh, kind of the economy where it occurs, but even just globally, and you could see a setback. So that's what you have to worry about there. Um, last thing I wanted to say a few words uh, about before I break for questions, um, government debt sustainability. How should we think about that? Okay, so big rise in government debt in lots of countries around the world. I'm showing you the advanced economies in this graphic right here. Okay, why are people more concerned about that? Well, it's an expectation that, remember I told you, interest rates are expected to remain low, at least by historical standards. They'll rise some if the Fed raises rates, but they're going to stay low by historical standards. This is why people are not so concerned about pandemic-driven rises in debt in richer countries. If you look at the gold line on this chart I'm showing you here, you can see that interest expenses have actually declined in 2020 despite debt shooting up massively, and that's because interest rates are so low. Okay. All right, but what about the rest of the world? Okay, I'm showing you emerging market economies in red here, lower income countries in green here. Okay, um, some increase in uh, debt for, uh, for, for the emerging market economies, uh, at least in 2020, and, and well, for both economies in 2020. Um, and I can say here, if you look at their gold lines, um, interest expenses have also remained flat ish for these countries. Um, which means so far so good, okay? But here's the thing you really gotta worry about, okay? Lower income countries, they can't take it for granted that their rates will remain low. Okay, this is why they're fiscally constrained in their efforts to mitigate the economic fallout from the pandemic. If they borrowed more, investors would want more compensation because of fears they couldn't service so much debt, okay? Um, even without borrowing more, you got to worry about the risks. Investors could become nervous about countries' ability to pay for, for a variety of kind of external disruption reasons, including, for example, capital outflows due to a richer country raising interest rates. Um, this could raise the rates they have to pay in their government debt. Potentially, worst case scenario, debt crises. That would be devastating not only for these countries, um, but have spillovers to the global financial system. So this is a complicated topic. I cannot do justice in it, even if I were to use all of my remaining time, uh, even if I took no questions and answers. Um, but I do want to just conclude with the thought that basically for both humanitarian reasons and to head off these potential debt crises, um, richer countries and international institutions like the IMF, the G20, they need to be thinking about kind of what sorts of liquidity measures grants, um, and maybe kind of even debt restructuring will be needed uh, by these economies. So um, I will end on that note. And um, I think there's time left for some questions. But thank you very much for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Karen, for that great presentation. And um, we'll begin taking your questions at this time. And we will alternate between live questions and the ones we've received via the Q&A function. Um, for those of you who would like to ask your question live, please use the hand raising function. And um, if we get to your question, we'll call your name and send you a request to unmute. And um, we anticipate several questions, so please be sure to accept the request quickly. Otherwise, we do have to move on. So we will start with something from the Q&A. Um, do you think this crisis will drive us to consider again that a strong industrial policy is very important for high income countries? Will regions with a diversified industry recover faster than others? Um, I think high uh, so, so I think the answer there is um, uh, yes, to some extent. I think we're, I, I think we're already, uh, you know, seeing that to some extent. If you look at, for example, what uh, uh, President Biden has um, kind of proposed for the United States, I think there is. Um, I think this all kind of builds off a um, trend, uh, uh, recognizing the limits of market outcomes. 
Um, just, just quickly, I think, you know, one of the things that has changed uh, in, during the pandemic and that we, we don't know quite where it's going to go post pandemic is how people see globalism and the benefits of globalism. So, you know, if, if, if that's the angle you're going at, I, I, I think it, it remains to be seen kind of what the impact of this crisis is going to be on globalism. Um, oh, hi, uh, Hans from uh, Sweden. Thank you very much. An excellent lecture. Um, could you perhaps comment a little bit on China and the insights? How relevant are they for the Chinese economy? And I mean, China spoke of the, the global financial crisis as the transatlantic financial crisis. How do you see Chinese growth, COVID, inflation, automation? Does that matter for the U.S. economy and for the rest? Uh, or if not, why? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I mean, so China, so I, I spent very little time on China, um, which is kind of unusual for a talk on the global economy, just because their experience has been so much different uh, from the rest of the world. I think so. Brief, so the China issue is quite, quite complicated, but I, I do think um, they, they, you know, spectacular the job they did containing their uh, pandemic. Um, and I think it, it did kind of a demonstrate kind of the importance of, um, of uh, kind of good public health policy and how in this context, public health policy is economic policy. They were the only uh, you know, major country to show an increase in their GDP uh, last year. Um, I, I will say that, uh, you know, it's not, I think a lot of people who have been thinking about this have said, you know, it's not really clear that you, you could actually do what China did in, in countries in the West uh, for, for various uh, social and cultural reasons. Um, so China, I mean, I think, uh, so where are they going to come out? I mean, I think, um, I think the thing, uh, you know, one of the big economic uh, changes going forward for China is just that I, I do think a, a lesson that um, companies and governments have uh, learned uh, over the past year has been the fragility of global uh, supply chains. And I, I do think, you know, this trend was already underway, partly because of these trade wars we had in the years leading up to the pandemic. But I do think we're going to see um, countries diversifying kind of production around the world, which is going to have implications for the Chinese economy. Uh, Roberta, are you there? It looks like you yes, are. Thank you. Right. Don't you think the digital divide is one of the factors for economic scaring? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, and I didn't, again, I, 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 the scarring, the digital divide is is huge. Um, so I, I think it's, it's very much related to kind of the, the K-shaped recovery issue that, uh, uh, you know, some jobs are, uh, uh, you I know, think so. easily, easily, more easily uh, uh, kind of done, uh, you know, digitally, they can be done remotely because of the digital divide. Um, but on top of that, I, I think one of the big issues, uh, which perhaps you're getting at is just um, kind of with having to have children, uh, uh, you know, in school remotely, uh, you know, children going from young children all the way up through college students, uh, if, if you don't have, and I saw this with my own students at Harvard, if you don't have access to adequate uh, internet at home uh, and computer resources, uh, that's, that's made a huge difference in the quality of the education you've got over the past year. And that's a channel of kind of longer term scarring. It'll be years before we understand just how uh, important that scarring has been. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll go to the Q&A. There's a couple of questions in here that I'm going to combine around um, automation. So to what extent did, the, did COVID accelerate structural changes in the economy, such as autom automation? And where does this lead? And also, has this pandemic prepared us for the fourth industrial revolution, the impact of AI and automation? Yeah. Um, so this is all very interesting. Uh, and I, I, I think you know, there's a, a lot of automation issues you could get into related to the pandemic. Um, and I do think it kind of it accelerated um, some of these, um, uh, te you know, technologies that um, are, are um, kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of had a, again, this goes back to the K-shaped recovery issue, very, very different depending from where, you, where you're sitting in society. Um, you know, someone like me, kind of all these innovations we've had over the past year, it's going to make me easier. It's going to make it easier for me to do my job and, you know, potentially make me more effective at doing it. 
yeah, so it's been enhancing for me. Um, but, uh, you know, automation, um, you know, for kind of in, workers lower in the income distribution, uh, you know, basically in some cases going to replace their jobs. So uh, in some ways I would say uh, what we've seen over the past year has been a bit of an acceleration of the um, kind of trends we've already seen in the economy. Now, what I didn't talk about, sometimes people say, well, you always talk about the negative things that might happen coming out of the crisis. Can't you tell us about some upside things coming out of the crisis? I do think um, it's possible. We're going to see like a huge surge in productivity uh, in coming years as we uh, basically uh, harness these technologies that have been kind of developed during the pandemic. Uh, and that that's going to be um, probably mostly beneficial to uh, kind of people at the top of the income distribution, but maybe not entirely. Because remember one of the um, things that countries around the world have struggled with for you know, decades now is just how expensive it is to deliver higher education. Uh, and it's just been incredible to see, you know, my colleagues at the Kennedy School, including the executive education team, uh, you know, harness this technology to basically maybe kind of kind of make all this kind of good stuff available at lower cost to a wider group of people. And so maybe that's an upside for everybody. Great. Um, we'll take another live question, uh, Zaheer. Um, uh, uh, thanks uh, for a very, very eloquent uh, lecture. Uh, may I ask you that during this economic distress, uh, is there any policy framework for uh, giving a relief to the countries which are already under a lot of debt pressure uh, for procuring the vaccines, etc.? Thank you. Um, it is, as far as I know, it's being worked on, uh, but, um, so, I mean, there has been a lot of, um, thinking already, you know, that you hear the IMF talking about what they're doing. You, you hear the G20, you know, what, what comes out of the G20. I can tell you from kind of people I know, um, kind of working behind the scenes, there is, uh, kind of stuff under developed under development to kind of basically help on this angle. Um, but I, but I basically, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, the humanitarian crises we've seen in countries like India um, has really changed people's uh, thinking about uh, kind of the responsibility that richer, I'm not saying it's changing everybody's thinking, but it's changing a lot of people's thinking about the responsibility that richer countries um, have to uh, lower income countries. Um, so, so I, I would, you know, we've had some good news on vaccine uh, kind of technology. We're seeing the companies uh, uh, say that kind of they're, you know, I mean, there's, there's good news and bad news, but I'm not, I'm seeing them say that they'll be able to get the vaccines out there more quickly than one might have originally expected kind of on a worldwide basis. Um, what I'm hoping uh, we'll see is that richer countries step up and, and pay for more of this. Great. We are Thank you. just about Thank at you. time. Karen, could you take one more live question maybe, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, Erwin? Yes, thank you, uh, Professor. I have a question about in <clears throat> inflation. Could it rise to very high levels because of all the uh, capitals put is into the market? Are, um, uh, the inflation will rise after the economy, economy picks up and the governments will try a soft landing, but then the inflation picks up, up with a delay. Is that possible? Um, yes, it's possible. <laughs> Uh, the, I mean, this is, this is the hard part about, I, I think central banks are in just like this really hard situation, uh, right now. Um, they, given what we learned in the late 2010s about the, the value of like getting your economy, uh, kind of nice, you know, getting it kind of nice and, and heated up, <laughs> uh, both because it takes you out of this recession that could otherwise take a really long time and because it has this benefits uh, kind of in the lower part of the income distribution uh, has made a lot of central banks say, uh, you know, we're gonna wait, we're gonna, we're gonna be patient here. We're gonna see inflation actually pick up so that not just get to our target, we're gonna see it get, you know, above 
our target materially above our target on a sustained basis. This kind of like kind of wait and see approaches is, is basically kind of a, a, a new one for central banks, you know, not to get out ahead. Uh, and, and the hope is, as you said, for a soft landing where, well, it gets higher and then kind of the central bank does its magic and inflation comes back down. But, you know, the fact that inflation is dependent on expectations and expectations are inherently um, kind of psychologically driven and that we've had this really long period where expectations have just been so kind of settled, so anchored that we haven't really had a lot of variation to, to really study what causes inflation expectations to move. But all of this um, kind of basically gets at the risk you're talking about, which is who's to say that this is all going to work out and have a happy ending uh, if they don't get ahead of it. Um, I mean, I basically think that they're doing the right thing, given what we know now. Uh, but you can't rule out the possibility that by the time they raise rates, uh, that the psychology will have changed in some way that's going to put them in a bad situation. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you to everyone who joined us today.